The title of this is how to, uh, uh, we have God's promise of his care and protection, but uh, this is really weird. How, how many like to have fun? So, you know, if you got to know me, you'd know I just, I just like to have fun. And because I'm a pastor, everybody takes me too seriously, and I just don't like that. Because I like, so my kids, you know, because they're pastor's kids, and all, all on the way to school, I would make jokes, we would laugh, I would sing, sing crazy songs and blah, blah. But what came to me, this is really strange. So what came to me this morning was, uh, I think it was last November, one of my grandkids brought a book in, I think it's around Thanksgiving. In fact, in fact, on my phone, when I do that, there's a picture of a, a bunch of the kids in our house, uh, my ne- nieces and nephews and grandkids, and, and we're reading. Now, I didn't realize the book is there. Look at there. So there's a book in my hand, and that's what I was thinking about, when, believe it or not, when I came up here. And the name of the book was so startling, I looked at it twice. I said, what in the world? And they said, read it to us. So we all piled up in a big chair in my living room, and I read the book. And the name of the book was Winky Wonky Donkey. Anybody ever heard of that book? <laughs> How many have heard of that book? Well, I know a lot about you. <laughs> you got grandkids or kids or whatever. But anyway, I was thinking about the world we're living in. It's a winky wonky world. Yeah, it's messed up. How many know it's true? And we're trying to figure out how to navigate. But um, yesterday, I, I had another experience of God giving me a word, one, one word to describe something. And this has been going on, I don't know, the last... Wow, at this point, six, seven, eight, nine years, maybe ten years. Not ten years, about ten years. Uh, God just gave me a word that describes something. So, see, God knows what you're thinking, and he knows how to get your attention. So, for me, because I love words, in fact, I have etymology books in my office, and I like to look up word origins. I've got a dictionary on my iPad, and I can look up word origins. You know, they're Latin, or they're French, or they're Old English, or whatever. And this, so words, words. So this word came to me to describe today, yesterday, and I mentioned it to the people that were here at prayer. I encourage you to come on Saturdays at nine. We have a really good time praying. But the word he gave me to describe the world right now is the word, and I never use this word, convoluted. So I went and looked up, and always when he gives me the word, I go look it up because I don't want to think that I know what it is. Convoluted, the definition is really short, extremely complex, and difficult to follow. Does that describe today? And then, and then when I look up a word, then, then to really want to know the nuances of meaning, look up the synonyms. A synonym is not the same word, but it's a word that has a similar meaning. So the synonyms for convoluted, listen to this. Does this not describe the world we're living in? Complicated, complex. Involved, intricate, elaborate, impenetrable, serpentine. That's a different take. Uh, Tortuous, torturous, tangled, confused, confusing, bewildering, baffling, puzzling, perplexing. Here's a funny one, fiddly, plotty. Doesn't that describe today? I was thinking, wow, God, why, why are you talking to me about that? So, so, so we're living in a time that everybody's got to make some choices. I don't care who you are. You're making choices, and I don't care what country you're living in. Every country has to make a choice. Every group of people in every country has to make a choice. Uh, people that don't know the Lord have to make choices. People that know the Lord, churches have to make choices. Pastors have to make choices. What path are you going to li- live on? What ideology is going to control you? Because there's lots of things going on. The other thing that happened, I was uh, on my lawnmower of all places on Friday. I mentioned part of this to the prayer team yesterday, but um, I got a little riding lawnmower and I just ride around, cut my grass and stuff and bag all my clippings and stuff. So I was in the middle of doing all that and all of a sudden I'm thinking, and I usually meditate, usually I got earbuds in my ears with some you know, things to protect my hearing. Uh, over it and um, but this time I said no I'm just going I'm just going to meditate today so I was just musing how many know you need to muse and think so I'm just thinking and 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 it just kept coming up to me because I was thinking about the world the shape we're in where we're going where we're headed what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and such and thinking about some of those things but then what came to me here in my mind's eye I'm on my own more dry oh, in my mind's eye I see uh, George Bush senior that means George W. Bush's daddy, right? 
So we're talking about 89, 1989, 1990. I'm in my early 30s. And he's standing up, and I remember watching, and he said these words. He said, because we are coming upon a new world order. How many remember him saying that? That's the first time publicly I heard anybody in our nation say that. For me, maybe you've heard differently. But for me, and that, twi- that turned my head, said, whoa, 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 what do you mean a new world order? Well, now here it is, what, 30 plus years later, that new world order actually is the regime of the Antichrist that's rising to power worldwide. See, it's not going to suddenly, all of a sudden, whoop, there, yes, there, no, no, no. What's going to happen is it's, it's creeping, slowly crawling. And it's been doing that for a long time. And then there are people worldwide who have an ideology and a mindset and a heart passion to control. Now, when I say control, I mean control in a broad way. I'm talking about control what you think, what you value, how you live, what you do financially, where you, what you do as a, as a job how you make your money, what you do with your money, where you live and how you live. Now, that's not just in America. How many know that's all over the world? And insult to injury, two years ago, the whole world changed with the corona situation, and that was used by this ideology of new world order. How many hear me? Is it your conspiracies? No, I just read the Bible. And it's uncanny to me how the Bible's lining up with current, or current events are lining up with what I've read all my life. You hear me? It's uncanny. So this new world order has become uh, a a way for the people groups of the world to be controlled, uh, what they think to be controlled, how they live to be controlled. And uh, listen, it's going to come all the way down to what you eat being controlled. Do you know that uh, I'm just kind of hoofing it. I I got notes, but y'all got to give me grace in the back. I'm going to hit it, but we'll see how it goes. Kind of mix it up a bit. But uh, how many know uh, since December, did you know that 17, listen, 17 uh, places that either manufacture food or distribute food have been destroyed by fire in America? Uh, Does that catch you as weird? Well, there's a lot of other weird things happening. Now, why am I saying all that? The world is changing and... um, Where's Ann? Ann, that shirt you had. Where's Ann? I saw your face. Where's Ann? There you, there you are. Ann had a shirt. What was? What did you say on that shirt? No, she said she had a shirt on yesterday. I said I love that. Normal isn't coming back. Jesus is. Yeah. I know she didn't want me to say that, but I said it. So if you want a shirt, I like that shirt. I might go get me one. Anyway, that's that's where it is. I don't think what we knew. Or what has been is coming back the way it was. Now, I got butthurt about that. (laughs) However you want to say it. And, uh, you know, I was kind of aggravated. And the good news is you weren't here to see me because nobody was coming to church at the time. I said, God, what in the world's going on? And I knew intuitively, well, the world's changing, but I didn't expect it to be like this. I don't like this. He said, well, it don't matter what you like. It's what's happening. But, but in the middle of all that, the Lord really spoke to me, and I found out that I was uh, really too attached to things. Uh, I valued some things more than I should. They weren't bad things, just things I like to do and, you know, things I enjoy. I, I just wouldn't enjoy them at the moment. And, and it's like the further we went into it, it's like, okay, you enjoyed that season of life, didn't you? I said, I, I did. Some things, yeah. He said, well, we'll get over that because I'm not sure it's going to come back the way it was. And, and again, I just really got aggravated about it. And, and really, I, you've heard me say this before. I went through like a grieving process where I was in denial. And then I got angry. And then I accepted it. And, and I actually cried a little bit by myself in my little crocodile tears. <laughs> what was me, you know? But I figured out that, okay, so, th- something different's happening worldwide. And Jesus is coming back. If that ever hits you, you can't be the way you were. See, what that does is, is, is solidifies 
who you are and what you value. And then, and then you, you need to learn to spend time doing things you value. Things, okay, things with eternal consequence, not just for the here and now. Right now, what's pushed on the American culture, do it right now, make it feel good, enjoy yourself, and don't worry about tomorrow. Now that, my friend, is the spirit of Antichrist. Did you hear what I just said? So, uh, we, we, we need to ask ourselves some questions, and I've got them in the notes. My notes, again, are online, so just uh, feel free to go look at them while I read some of them. I don't know how this is going to come out, but we'll see. So, uh, here's some questions that we should ask ourselves in the light of all I just said. Am I ready for what's coming? And, and then this one, I have to explain this, are the fundamentals of life in place for me? What do you mean by fun- fundamentals of life? Well, is now this sounds funny, but this is the most important thing you got going. Is your faith strong or weak? Strong faith doesn't stagger at the promise of God in unbelief, but it's strong and it gives glory to God and thanks God for doing what it can't see yet. Strong faith thinks God's doing stuff like we just say, when it looks like nothing's happening. Strong faith says, God's answering my prayer, God is good, when it looks like He's not answering your, his, uh, the prayer and everything is bad. Why we look not at the things seen, but the things unseen. How many hear me? So is your faith strong? Only way you have strong faith is to get in the Word and then exercise what you know against the circumstances of life. Be a doer. Do what God's Word says, even when it doesn't feel good. Next, secondly, is my prayer life strong? D.L. Moody said this. I was trying to get a quote come up. It's more important to learn to pray than to gain a college education. Now, we tout education today, and education is available to everybody in some way. Uh, But he said it's more important to learn to pray, and I would agree with that. I know people who have letters and initials after their name, but they fail in the circumstance of life. Did you hear what I said? So your smarts aren't going to get you through some of the places in life. How many hear me? It's who you know and what you believe that's going to do it. So is your prayer life strong? If not, come on Wednesday, Saturdays at 9. We'll help you strengthen it. Uh, uh, question, am I close to God? That means is there, is there anything between me and him? Is there anything I'm doing that he, I know he doesn't like? My conscience is smiting me about it, but I just kind of leave it alone. Well, that's not what we want to do. We want to clean it up so we're close as we can be. Um, uh, am I keeping good relationships? That's another good question. Are my relationships on the up and up, or are or, 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 or they like that word convoluted? Like, okay, I can't go over here because that person's there, and I can't go over there because that person's there. And I, I don't want to text that person, and I don't want to see that person on Facebook. But, uh, you know, you don't want to do that. You want to keep good, strong relationships. Yes or no? That means we have to forgive. When people say things, do things that we don't particularly appreciate, we've got to let it go, right? And then, then the last thing uh, is... Are you naturally prepared for what may or may not come? That is, that is. Do you have some extras on hand in case the supply chain fails? How many of you heard about some of that? You know? So, so, you know, if if you're a week-to-week or a day-to-day person, I know people that go to the grocery store at night to get off at 4.30 because I've seen them, because I've done it myself. (laughs) Go to the grocery store, got to go get me some... Got to go get me some veggies. Got to go get me a salad. Get me some baked potato. Got to get me a, you know, a starch. And then go get some protein. Then we're going to go home and cook it. Well, you, you, you want to do something beyond that and have some preparations. How many hear me? So some people call it being a prepper. I just say make proper preparation for what may or may not be here in the future, right? Because the world's changing. And if you're expecting things to go uh, the way you thought they would go, it, it may not happen. Then, then in our country, we're also... Uh, at a cultural tipping point. How many have felt that? Disney just lost f- over $50 billion last week. And you know, what is that, a cultural tipping point? Uh, they also lost all of their tax exemptions. You know, what happened? Well, they went woke. What is woke? Go read and figure it out. I don't know. You figure it out. 
They, what, what happened was they started valuing things that a large majority of, of people in our nation don't. Did you hear what I just said? So, so see, we're at a cultural tipping point. See, that affects, affects me, you. It affects your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. It's going to affect our way of life. How many hear me? I'm talking big-time things here, strong stuff. Uh, now, you put your head in the sand and ignore it and say, well, don't we talk, why are we talking about that at church? Because we live it every day. And if you can't talk about it in the church house, what you going to do in your house? So, I need to mention some of these things. Anyway, uh, the question is, really, in America, are we going to forsake? And this is not, I didn't even got to my message yet. I'll get to it. Are we going to forsake the paths of previous generations and the belief systems that really made this a nation that people want to come? In fact, our, our southern border is being overrun because laws aren't being listened to. Yes or no? Why is that happening? Well, again, this, this new world order says all nations are the same. There should be no people groups with any history of who they were, what they're attached to. They should have no values that any other nation doesn't have. Did you know that that's going on? So, so that has, um, that's filtered down into our media. So all of the media that you watch, let me say mainstream legacy media, it's controlled. It's controlled by this thing. Did you know that? Now, many of you, I'm saying things that you've heard. Other thing, others, I may be saying something that you haven't heard and maybe you don't want to admit, but it's still the truth. So I'm going to err on the side of truth. I, 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 I tell truth even if it hurts me. I taught my kids I don't have a lie, and so for you, I've got to be honest, we're, we've got a huge things going on. So we're again at a cultural tipping point, and, and we're, we're bom- bombarded in media, we're bombarded in entertainment, uh, we're bombarded now in our school system, uh, with play- and even places like Disney. Why, why, why is Disney, why did they go that way? B- because children are there. If you can change a child's thinking processes, you can change a whole generation. If you can change what people hear, when they listen to the news, you can change the whole culture. Yes or no? So, you know, for me, I made a choice. Uh, there's nobody going to control me except Jesus. And if you lie, I'll love you, but I cut you off. I won't listen to you. Because if you tell one, you've got to tell a thousand. And you've become a liar. And liars go to hell. And that doesn't happen to be the path I'm on. How about you? If you listen to lies, you'll become a liar. And how many want to tout lies? Well, blah, 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 blah. Well, how do you know that so-and-so said it? Well, who's so-and-so, so-and-so? Where'd they get that from over there? Where'd that come from over there? What's the basis of that? Control, lies, deception. And we're living in that right now. How many have figured it out yet? Anyway, it's a lot to say. It actually is another message. In the middle of all that, we don't need to be filled with confusion and fear. Yes or no? God wants us to have faith. In fact, Jesus said, I love this. Do not let your hearts be troubled, John 14, 1. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my Father's house. Is that good news? So see, in the middle of everything I just said, and, and hopefully, hopefully you get the idea that we're living in a, a wink, uh, a, what is it, winky wonky world, <laughs> convoluted world, yeah. So, so you want some good news now? To counteract all this, say, well, well, pastor, as a believer, how am I supposed to be on the up and up and be happy and joyful? And it's like, you know, be smiling when everybody else is going, my Lord, look what happened again yesterday. Well, the way you do that is you got to know something about our Heavenly Father. He, uh, to get His people through hard places, He makes covenants. Did you hear me? And, and when He makes a covenant, He keeps it. If He says something, 
He's going to do it, and you just simply need to trust that he will. He is and will. How many hear me? So, so uh, the covenant he made, you know, after Adam and Eve sinned, it kind of cut everybody off from him, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes, and, and it became a real mess. And then, uh, you know, God had to, uh, had to wipe out the world with a flood in, in Noah's day. And, and then later on comes Abraham. And Abraham, God did something to Abram was his name. Exalted father was his name. And God changed his name from Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of a multitude. In Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will uh, bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And here's the last phrase. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Would you read that out loud with me? All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now, now that's talking about the covenant God made with Abraham. He, he promised to bless the families of earth through him. He's covenanted, covenanted uh, his care for us. And God has actually obligated himself to watch over us, even in difficult, winky-wonky times. So Hebrews 8, 6 New Living Translation, but now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. Is that good? So we've got a better covenant with God in the new covenant than the old covenant folk had, and he took care of his old covenant folk. So if we have a better covenant and he took care in every way of his old covenant folk, as long as they trusted him and kept the covenant, can we expect that even in a better way, God will take care of us today? Absolute truth. So again, Galatians 3 uh, tells us that Jesus Christ became a curse for us, that the blessing of Abraham, watch this, can come on us. Watch. Galatians 3.13, Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law when he hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it's written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessings he promised to Abraham. Did you hear what I just read? Woohoo! Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles. Who's a Gentile? That's anybody that's not a Jew. That would be you, unless you're Jew. And then if you're a converted Jew, a Messianic Jew, that belongs to you too, right? Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing. Everybody say the same blessing. See, that's significant. He promised Abraham uh, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. In fact, Galatians goes, any, uh, goes even further and tells us that, that we're sons of Abraham. Now, that's pretty cool. And as sons of Abraham, that means we're in his family. And then all the family promises given to Abraham belong to me and you. Yes or no? That's really cool. So Galatians 3.29. And now that you belong to Christ, you are true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. Watch. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. That's really good. You know, I was raised in church and never heard this. I knew how to get saved, but beyond that, you're on your own, buddy. <laughs> so. But Genesis 12 again, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, God said to Abraham, and curse those who treat you with contempt, and the families, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. So I want to take you back to two instances in Israel and show you something here. Um, to God's dealings with Israel during Joseph's time, during Moses' time, and show you that in the worst of the worst times, in the old covenant, that didn't have as good as promises as we have, God took care of his people. And, and the inference obviously is, if he took care of them, he's going to take care of us, right? So, so, so um, God's covenant uh, with Abraham, he covenanted to protect Israel uh, during the time of famine. Now, when God made this covenant with Abraham, he knew that a famine eventually would come to Abraham's ancestry, and it happened during uh, Jacob's day and then Joseph's day. 
uh, Joseph was Abraham's what great grand is that right yeah uh, child so uh, Joseph had a dream and saw his family bowing down before him and made the real mistake maybe had a bit of personal pride I saw y'all kneeling down to me bowing down to me if you tell your 11 brothers that I mean listen you got a problem there's a lot of testosterone in the room and somebody's gonna whip somebody's tail so why did he do that? I don't know. I think he was just full of pride. That's what I think. Anyway, they got upset with him, threw him in a the hole. Then he got, uh, he got found and sold into slavery. Bottom line, uh, gosh, 13 years later, 13 years later, Joseph is, is prime minister of Egypt. He's right under the Pharaoh, which is the head honcho in Egypt. And, and Joseph's right there, and he interpreted you know, Pharaoh's dream and you know, said there's going to be a famine in the land. And uh, anyway, how do you think Joseph felt for 13 years being in a prison? And then, you know, the story goes really great, insightful story. Got lied about and wrong things happened, stayed in prison, and he ne- never did anything worthy of prison time. But he never got his, it never got in his heart. He always had a good attitude. And you know what you'll find out? Regardless of what happens to you in life, if you just keep a good attitude, you'll come up good on the other side of it. Sometimes. And this is in my notes. The worst thing that can happen becomes the best thing that can happen. It's really strange because God, God turns cursing into blessing. He's just, he's just an amazing, if you got a covenant with him, he has an amazing way of doing that. Well, anyway, the, a famine came and, uh, you know, everybody's running out of food. They don't know what to do. They're selling, they're, they're giving all the money away. They're selling their land. They're selling their properties just to have some food. And Genesis 45, 5 through 10. But don't be upset. This is Joseph when he revealed himself to his brothers. If you don't haven't read the story, go read it. It's really, really good. Don't be upset, he says to his brothers. Don't be angry when they come to Egypt for food. Angry with yourself for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine has been ravaged, has ravaged the land for two years and will last five more years and there will... There will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Now hurry back and tell my father, to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God made me master over all the land of Egypt, so come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen. Everybody say Goshen. Uh, where you can um, be near me with all your children, grandchildren, flocks, herds, everything you, you own. So there was a big famine, and God sent, God sent his covenant people to a place where there was plenty of food, and God took care of them. How many know he's a covenant-keeping God? So, so what's the bottom line? If God took care of, of Joseph's brothers and his family and his daddy during a terrible famine and nobody had food and God placed Joseph in a place where everybody's needs could be met in all the world, particularly his family who had a covenant with God, will God take care of me and you when things go south? If we trust him, the obvious answer is absolutely 100% yes. Yes or no? So... Uh, God's covenant with Abraham also protected Israel. And I mentioned a few weeks ago, the 10 plagues enacted against the gods of Egypt during Moses' day. So, you know, Joseph and Joseph came and went and uh, hundreds of years passed and uh, Egyptians began to, uh, they didn't like the, they didn't like the Israelites anyway because they were because they were uh, shepherds, they were somewhat nomadic, and they, they raised animals, and they stunk. And so they put them in this side land called Goshen, away from them, so they wouldn't have to have a whole lot to do with them. And then they just simply, after a number of years, made them slaves. Be careful. Be wary of anybody who promises you to take care of you and meet all of your needs, because one day they could turn against you. Just a thought. I would rather trust God than the government. If you're dependent on the government to make, meet all your needs, you're going to be an extremely disappointed person. Did you hear what I just said? You need to have a big moment of awakening. Anyway, God saw the plight that Israel was in 
They were, sla- they were slaves. They were building the Egyptian kingdom. And he remembered his covenant with Moses. And that covenant moved God to action. Listen, Exodus 2, 23 through 25. Years passed, the king of Egypt died. Israelites continued to groan under the burden of slavery. They cried out for help. And their cry rose up to God. And this is really significant. Look at verse 24. God heard their groaning. Say it out loud. God heard their groaning. And he remembered his covenant promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My Lord. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. Wow, that's incredible. So Moses was directed by God to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. If you don't, the gods of Egypt, they're going to have black eyes and sore feet because God's going to whip their backside. And, you know, basically, the, uh, you know, Pharaoh said, you know, you need to go take a hike, Bubba. And, and, and he just kept coming back. And so the ten plagues were enacted. But what I want you to get out of this, listen to the language in the following verses. I'm just going to read them. You'll get it really quickly. And keep in mind that if we're heirs of God's promise to Abraham, then we today must be provided for with the same care our Heavenly Father gave to the Israelites during a time of plagues in Egypt. And that was a time of judgment. We are entering into a worldwide time of judgment. And it could be that God's going to judge the people in our nation who are taking advantage of the majority. There is a minority taking advantage of the majority right now. Did you hear what I'm saying? And nothing's working right. Have you noticed lately? So I don't care what political persuasion you are. I'm not talking about that. Things aren't working right now, my friends. Yes or no? It's not getting any better. It's rather growing worse. And you got to admit it. So, so regardless of what's coming, God's promised to take care of his people. Now listen, now I'm just going to read this here. It, 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 just like he took care of the Israelites, listen to this. Here's Moses speaking to Pharaoh, the plague of flies, Exodus 8. Uh, if you refuse, verse 21, if you refuse then, I will sw- send swarms of flies on you, your officials, your people, all their houses. The Egyptian homes will be filled with flies. The ground will be covered with them. And that was against one of the Egyptian gods talked about a few weeks ago. But um, this time I will spare the region of what? Oh, where my people live, no flies will be found there. Then you will know that I am the Lord and that I am uh, present even in the heart of your land. I will make a clear distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will happen tomorrow. Wow, wow. And so the judgment came against the Egyptian gods, but not against God's people. And the people in the land were affected, but not God's people, because they had covenant with it. You get it, right? Now, here it is again. Exodus 9, 1. This is the plague on livestock. Uh, go back to Pharaoh. The Lord commanded Moses. Tell him this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they can worship me. If you continue to hold them and refuse to let them go, the hand of the Lord will strike all your livestock, your horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, and goats with deadly plague. But the Lord will again make a distinction between the livestock of the Israelites and that of the Egyptians. Not a single one of Israel's animals will die. The Lord has already set the time for the plague to begin. He has declared that he will strike the land tomorrow. And the Lord did just as he said. The next morning all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but the Israelites didn't lose a single animal. When you worship the devil and people that worship false gods are actually worshiping Satan, worshiping demon spirits. Paul said it very clearly in 1 Corinthians 10. Huh? He said, but if you worship me, (laughs) you'll be spared. The same applies today, my friends. Did you hear me? Exodus 9, 22. This is the plague of hail. Then the Lord said to Moses, lift up your hand toward the sky so the hail may fall on the people, the livestock, the plants throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses lifted his staff toward the sky. The Lord sent thunder, hail, lightning flashed toward the earth. The Lord sent a tremendous hailstone uh, hailstorm against the land of Egypt. Never in all of the history of Egypt had there been a storm like that with such devastating hail and continuous lightning. It left all of Egypt in ruins. The hail struck down everything in the open field, people, animals, plants alike. Even the trees were destroyed. The only place without hail was the region of Goshen where the people of Israel live. Woo-hoo! Is that awesome? Now you know that sets my feet to dancing. 
We had a song in the 70s that had something like that. Exodus 11, death of the firstborn, verse 4, Moses announced to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, at midnight tonight I will pass through the heart of Egypt. Talked about this a couple of weeks ago. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has heard before or ever will hear again. But amongst the Israelites it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Wow. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians, the non-covenant people, and the Israelites, the covenant people. Is that not awesome? Y'all, that bobs my cork. We live in the land of Goshen. Spiritually, God's promise, Psalm 23, I'll make a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I mean, come on, y'all. I want you to see yourself living in the land of Goshen. You get it? Uh, so, so, so covenant. See, God's a covenant God, and he's a covenant-keeping God. And when he makes covenant, he keeps his end of the promise. But you've got to eat, keep your end. You get it? So, so here we are to summarize. See, I said that pretty quickly. I'm, look at that. Look at that. So let's summarize real quickly. So look, we really are going into a time of judgment. And I think the God's that a portion of the people in America and some of the leaders are worshiping the God of mammon, money. Illegitimate money. Yeah. Yeah, and I've talked about the the gods of, of sexual immorality and they're trying to push that now on our children and you need to let your voice be heard. If you're a covenant person, let the voice of God, your heavenly father, be heard through you. Let his light shine through you. If not, we will lose our nation. Did you hear what I just said? So really, we're, we're kind of on the, on the cusp, the edge of which way we're going. It could go either way. And let me say this. I think that eventually, and maybe, maybe, maybe sooner than later, and maybe later than sooner, I think God can hear our prayers and delay. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance, right? So I've been saying it looks like we're right on the edge. But you know, God could say, you know what? I heard your prayer. Phew. Here's the blessing for a little bit longer. Some more people can come into the family. But he may not delay. He may say, well, time to come back now. Better time, better, no better time than now. And judgment, when Jesus comes back, it enacts serious judgments against the gods that people worship worldwide, including in America, just like Moses, uh, the, the plagues against Egypt through Moses were against the gods of the Egyptians. Does that make sense? And so you got the sex god, the Baal, the god Baal, Molech. Are we worshiping that like crazy today? Everybody in America thinks sex is just wonderful. Now, they want, now we want to teach it to our three and four year olds, which to me, that's going to bring some serious judgment. Did you hear what I said? If you don't like what I said, well, I just love you. But I, I would submit to you that your values are wrong. Your values are twisted. I just read something. I get off on a tangent. I just read yesterday, somebody said, well, you know, if, uh, if you protect the workplace and you don't allow people to be harassed sexually in the workplace, what you're doing with kids when you're talking to them about sexual orientation, age three, age four, age five, friends, that is harassment to the nth degree. Now, that ought not be. And if you've got children in school and they're they're eating this garbage at school and you do nothing, you're responsible. And, and then when our nation fails, you're responsible. How many hear me? When you go to the voting booth, figure out who's, who's, who's doing this stuff. Figure out who's touting. Well, we got to make this thing real open and free. We want all our kids, if they want a sex change, get a sex change. If we want our people in, a, in the military to get a sex change, let them have a sex change. Well, if you can have it, but you know what? You won't have safety. You won't have God's care and protection. Did you hear me? You're being political. No, I'm not. I'm being biblical and scriptural. Jesus said, let your light shine so that people will see your good works. So anyway, digressed a bit. Let me get back on the path. We have a covenant with God, y'all. 
through the shed blood of Jesus. Jesus is the surety. He's the guarantee of a new covenant based on better promises, Hebrews 8, 6. The blessings of Abraham are ours. Jesus, Jesus hung on the cross. He took the curse for us. The curse is poverty. The per- curse is sickness. The curse is spiritual death. And Jesus took all of them for us in his own body on the cross that we being dead to sin can live righteously. Is that good news or what? So God's promised to meet your needs, heal your body, and minister to you spiritually and set your feet to dancing. Did you hear me? So right now, the jig's up. And America, we're, 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 choosing, we're choosing what we're going to have. So I don't believe that every nation has to follow the ideology of one world government that eventu- will eventuate in the Antichrist coming on the scene in the Middle East. I think there'll be some nations that say, you know what? Take a hike, friend. You're not doing it in this nation right here. I would like for that to be America, wouldn't you? So how, how about you pray and let's believe God for our nation? What do you think? If, you, if we don't, then it's inevitable that there are forces trying to push us that way. And that means all of your freedoms are gone. That means the freedom to assemble, the freedom to speak your mind, which you need to speak your mind whether the social media likes it or not. And if they take you off, they take you off. Now, yeah, I'm not saying being unkind. I say be kind, but be real honest and truthful. Now people are wanting to back up because, well, they'll be taken off. Well, you know what? That's their problem, not yours. Anyway. I don't know where all this comes from. I, I didn't, didn't think this up. It just comes out. So I want to read in conclusion, and I'll be quiet, I think. There's one place in Scripture where the blessing of Abraham is just clearly elucidated. Right here, very clear. You can't miss it. And if you'll walk with God and seek first the kingdom, I don't care if hell's breaking loose. God will make a way for you. Like he made a way for Israel in Joseph's time. Like he made a way for Israel in Moses' time. The way he set them free by literally causing the Red Sea to part and, and, and then actually congeal or somehow freeze and, and then dried out the land with a, with a wind and they walked through not mud, dry land. Pfft, two and a half million people. Took a while. God's big. So here it is, the blessing of Abraham. Deuteronomy 28, first 14 verses. If you fully obey the Lord your God, carefully keep all His commands that I'm giving you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if, that's the qualifier, you obey the the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be what? You say that word every time I come up to it. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Blessed wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction, but they will scatter from you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on you every on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land He's given you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in His ways, the Lord will establish you as His holy people as He swore He would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord and they will stand in awe of you. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land He swore to your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock, abundant crops the Lord will send rain in the proper time from his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless the work you do you will lend to many nations but you'll never need to borrow from them if you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today and if you carefully obey them the Lord will make you the head and not the tail you will always be on top and never at the bottom you must not turn away from any of the commands I'm giving you today nor follow after other gods and worship them isn't that awesome And see what that does for me. I'll just kind of say, okay. He makes a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You get it? So a thousand may fall at your side. Psalm 91 says, 10,000 at your right hand. But it's not going to come near you. Because you have a covenant with God. So when Winky Wonky lands at your doorstep, say, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. What are you talking about? I don't have enough. What are you saying? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Father, we have covenant. 
I'm keeping my part. Thank you for keeping yours. Thank you for meeting my needs. The, the solid part of this is you've got to keep your part of the bargain. Don't worship false gods. Don't be sexually immoral. Don't be like the world we live in. Don't, don't put money first. Don't put things in first. Don't put yourself first. Don't put ambition first. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's God's promise in the last days to His people, to His church. Uh, God's able to make amazing things happen. So I know the Lord's talking to me and He's talking to me about things I need to be doing for my family, for my children, for my grandchildren, for me and Susan, for you. He's talking to me about provision. I've made choices and decisions. I'm not, I don't have time to talk about it now, but see the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Because I have, a, and, and listen, if you're in covenant with God and you're, you're fulfilling your part of the covenant, He'll talk to you. Did you hear what I said? He'll talk to you about your business. He'll talk to you about your finances. And now he'll talk to you about your retirement account. Oh, what's going to happen when the digital dollar comes in? What's going to happen when the stock market fails? What's going to happen when the federal government fails? And you got all your eggs in one basket. Selah. In the King James Bible, that means pause and think about that for a while. So you just want to seek God. We have a covenant, y'all. And like Joseph's day, we're in a time we need to make preparations for an uncertain future. What we can be certain about is, regardless of what comes, God will make a way for us.